It's the review that literally some of you have been waiting for. It's none other than the facelifted all-electric MG ZS EV. ZS EV. First and foremost, price and range, I like to get this stuff out of the way early. There are two variations of this model available. This is the Essence, which after the rebate will set you back just north of $45,000. However, there is a much more affordable version called the Excite, which after the rebate, get this, will set you back $41,365. And as someone who is part Dutch, my tightwad gland is really tingling right now. Both variations do 320 Ks per charge though, which is more than usable for most Kiwi families, but I just can't get over the price. I mean, both variations are still cheaper than a brand new Honda Civic. How are they doing that? It's genuinely baffling because as well as looking all right on its 17 inch alloys, this car has all the gadgets you could want too, like seated heats, climate control, rain sensing wipers, four USB charging ports and a PSC of 42, which somehow is 29 more than the first generation ZS EV. And this top spec Essence model has a massive panoramic sunroof which opens fully, allowing you to reenact that scene from Titanic. There's also heaps of legroom in the back with a completely flat floor and good headroom as well, with me being 178 centimeters tall or 5 foot 10. As for boot space, it's got a very low floor, making it big enough for a potato enthusiast at 359 liters. All with the seats down, it's 1100 liters, and it's even got little cargo net thingies too. Seriously, this car has it all, plus a bit more. This is the point in the video where I wanted to demonstrate the vehicle to load adapter. And what it is, it's a device that plugs in to the charging port on the front of the car, and it lets you turn this car into a giant four-wheel battery bank. So you can power household appliances off it. You can even be one of those annoying Aucklanders who goes camping and takes their TV. That can be you. Well, unfortunately, I just heard from the MG dude now, and the vehicle to load adapter isn't available yet, and the pricing won't be announced until the first quarter of 2023. Another thing I wanted to demonstrate was the MG iSmart mobile app that allows you to control your car from your phone. It can unlock the doors, or turn on the air conditioning, or find your car in a parking lot. Unfortunately, no matter how hard I tried, I could not find a version to install on my phone. Then I tried to find the raw APK file to install manually onto my phone, and I got one version to work, but I just couldn't quite get the QR code to connect, and then I tried a different version, but it failed, so I promise I really, really tried to get the iSmart app working, but as far as I can tell, it's not yet available in New Zealand. But something I can show you is this 10.1 inch touchscreen display, and those are real inches, not tender inches. And it's got a reasonably fast response time as well. You can click on everything and it loads up relatively quick. It has Apple, Android and CarPlay Auto, although both are cabled, and both variations of the car have that, although only one the top spec one has wireless charging, and as you can see, it only really just squeezes in there with a the cable. Some phones will, some phones won't. However, as for the display, you get a whole raft of stuff you can connect. You've obviously got sat-nav built into the car, which is not too bad. You've also got vehicle information, such as energy management. It shows you how much you're charging or discharging if you're using the vehicle to load adapter. You've also got 360-degree camera mode, and this is pretty cool. Not a lot of cars in this price point have this. It's like you're playing a computer game. The seats are really comfortable and in this top spec version, they're all electric and you can lower them down lower than my wheel to live. So you could actually be seven feet tall on this car. There's bucket loads of room. However, there is no lumbar support and the top spec version, this one, only comes with synthetic leather seats. And honestly, on a hot summer's day, I think I might prefer the cloth seats that come in the lower spec version because then your backside wouldn't sear like a pan fried snapper in the summer sun. The steering wheel is also adjustable as you'd expect but it's not telescopic. But even when set down low, I can still see the entire dashboard, and that's good because I quite like having the steering wheel set low. So all in all, this car seems good bang for buck. It's got gadgets, features, it's comfortable. I just wonder how they're doing it for that price. I mean, is it gonna be a Tesla Model Y beta? Is it gonna be an Atto 3 beta? I just don't know. I know I'm asking a lot from this car, and considering I have a face resembling a dropped pie, what? I'm in no position to have high standards, but let's be honest, that's never stopped me before. So without further delay, let's see if this car's any good. Now, it must be said, I am not a qualified MGologist. However, I still want to know how they've managed to get the price down for what feels like a really refined car. The ride quality is not wobbly. There's no rattles. The sound is quiet as well, and the steering is light. Maybe not so great for spirited driving in the countryside, but for a city car, 
this feels fantastic. There's bound to be something I hate about it. Watch this space. But right now, it feels very good. Suspiciously good. Now, being an electric car, it has regenerative braking, or K-E-R-S, as MG calls it, which is Kinetic Energy Recovery System. And what that means, if you've never heard of regenerative braking, is that when you take your foot off the accelerator, it turns the motor that drives the car into a generator. And the car slows down, and as it slows down, electricity goes back into the battery pack. Now, it doesn't mean that you can drive forever. It's not a perpetual motion machine, but it will give you about 15 or so percent back, back into the battery pack. And if you've never used it before, your first experience, your first reaction might be, ooh, that feels weird, the car's slowing down too much. But it is adjustable. So as you ease yourself into it, you can adjust the KERS switch to, there we are, one is the most mild. So if you take your foot off the accelerator, which I will do here, it feels just like a petrol burning car. It doesn't slow down too much, it coasts a lot. But if you select two or even three, it'll slow the car quite substantially. Now, not enough to enable what's called one-pedal driving, where it, the car will stop in traffic just using the accelerator. Some cars have very, very strong regenerative braking, which allows one-pedal driving. This one, I still have to put my foot on the brake when I come to a complete stop. Now, one thing that could be useful here is the power modes. There are three of them, and this being Royal Oak Roundabout, you're often gonna need a little bit of power To adjust the power modes, you simply press the mode button and that will give you either eco mode, which will maximize the range, try and get you that 320 k's per charge, or there's normal mode, which I like to use because it gives you a moderate response on the pedal, or if you want to feel sporty, there is sport mode. There it is, which instantly gives you much more response on the pedal. It doesn't change any of the characteristics with the suspension, it just makes it feel sportier. As soon as you just tap the accelerator, boom, it goes. And it has a reasonable amount of power in this car as well, 130 kilowatts, which doesn't make it a rocket ship, but with 280 newton meters of torque, it means that it does get up and go. And being front wheel drive, it does sometimes have a little trouble putting its feet down on the pavement. As for handling, this thing handles pretty good for what it is. It's a crossover vehicle, so you'd expect it to have a higher center of gravity, right? But no, it doesn't because it's an electric car with its battery pack underneath the body, which means it has a center of gravity lower than my self-worth. It's remarkable. It really clings to the corners fairly well. I'd like to see what it's like in the actual countryside. For that, I'm going to have to take it on a longer distance drive because right now, as you can see, I'm stuck in Auckland traffic. But with that light steering, and the quiet ride. I've been in much worse cars than this, let's say that. What I also found interesting is that the two vehicles that you can get, the Essence and the Excite, they both have the same motor, same performance, same range, but this one, the Essence version, the top spec one, weighs about 40 kilograms more, and that's because you've got added gadgets like the wireless phone charging and of course the electric folding mirrors, the electronic seats, all that sort of stuff, the gadgetry that you don't see under the hood. However, what I'd like to know, and I'm sure you do, is what is the actual difference, the real differences between the two models? Well, for that, we have to go to a voiceover. And the voiceover says the top spec model gets the panoramic sunroof and roof rails, heated front seats in synthetic leather, with the driver's seat being electronically adjustable. It also gets electronic folding door mirrors and rain sensing wipers, plus rear cross traffic alert and blind spot detection, wireless phone charging, and instead of a four speaker sound system in the lower spec model, the Essence gets a six speaker stereo, which as you can hear in this royalty free song I've got my hands on doesn't sound too bad. As for some final family figures, the rear seat has two ISO connections for kid seats and is 126 centimeters wide. The driver's seat, meanwhile, sits 68 centimeters off the ground on its lowest setting, and there's 164 centimeters between the boot lip and the front seats, but there's also no storage under the bonnet, so be warned. But enough specs, it's time to finally test the ZS EV on a longer distance drive. It's a new day, and today we're going on a road trip. The car is charged to 100%, and my destination today is Rotorua. Now, that is 220 kilometers from here, and in theory, that's going to use 70% of the battery. So we should have 30% left over. Let's find out. 
Problem is, is that this car officially can do 320 k's per charge, but that is according to the WLTP cycle, which is a cycle all electric cars use these days to determine how far you can go per charge. But problem with the WLTP cycle is that I like to think it's based on California kilometers, where it's all flat and the weather's fine and it's not too windy and there's birds singing and puppies and rainbows and all that stuff. This is the reality. Aotearoa has wind, hills, traffic, I'm about to go on a 110 km an hour zone on the Waikato Expressway. That's all going to eat into the range. So soon I'll be getting on the motorway and then I want to test the lane keeping assist and the adaptive cruise control to see how good it is. Now some cars are great, like the Tesla Model 3, Tesla Model Y or the BMW iX M60. And some of them, the lane keeping assist is quite terrible, like the Atto 3, which was very nomadic and liked to just wander around the road. Let's see what this one's like. I'm not expecting it to be epic because this is an incredibly affordable vehicle. Let's find out. First I've got to get on the motorway and escape Auckland. Oof, traffic looks Aucklandy. <laughs> All right, we have a long drive ahead of us, so let me start by turning on the adaptive cruise control. Okay, 91 it's set to. Let me put it up to 100 maximum. There we go. Okay, so apparently I can take my foot off the accelerator. Oh, look at that. Okay. Will it let me get close to the vehicle in front? How close will it let me get? Nope, that's not it. Oh, no, that turned the lights off. Wrong one, wrong, wrong, wrong knob. Problem is, I cannot see the stalk. And this is a problem I've had in a lot of cars, is that they put the cruise control stalk down behind the steering wheel, so I can't see what I'm doing. Oh yeah, okay, that's the distance between the vehicle in front. Okay, so twisting the knob adjusts the distance between the vehicle in front. I'm gonna set it to the minimum distance. Okay, it's catching up. How close will it safely drive to this Audi in front of us? Let's find out. Actually, that's quite close. That's a good close distance. All right, but what about the lane keeping assist? I have it turned on, I believe. Yeah, I'm, mm, it's all right. Oh, oh, easy, I didn't do that. Oh, carry on, okay. Yeah, it's, it's not the smoothest, most silky system, to be honest. Maybe that's where they've cut the costs. It does have other redeeming automatic features though, such as automatic headlight dipping. It uses the cameras in the car to detect if a car's oncoming, and if you've got your full beam lights on, easy tiger, it will dip the headlights down. Another automatic feature it's got is speed sign detection. So it uses the cameras built into this car to read the speed signs on the side of the road, and it'll display whatever the speed zone is on the dashboard. It's pretty cool. I would like and subscribe to that, and on that note, why not click the like and the subscribe button? It does actually make a difference, believe it or not. The power is in your hands, whether or not people get to see these videos. Cost you nothing, it's easy to do. Like, subscribe, please. Don't make me go back to OnlyFans. Oh, I guess the OnlyFans I'll ever have are the ones installed in cars, but that's all right because this one was doing a fine job climbing the Bombay Hills and tackling the Waikato Expressway with its 110 km per hour speed limit without destroying the economy. So far, the economy's doing great though. I thought this was gonna destroy the economy same with the Bombay Hills but no we're doing 14.4 units of electricity per 100k which has surpassed my expectations I don't know how they're good in getting economy this good out of such a large family car another thing that impresses me about this car is the warranty and I know warranties aren't a very sexy topic to talk about but this car has a seven year warranty with unlimited kilometers and that includes the battery and that is not normal for example we think of Toyota as the pinnacle of reliability right a lot of Kiwis do. Very reliable cars, but their new car warranty is three years or 100,000k for their basic warranty. Whereas this one has a seven year unlimited warranty. However, there are some things that are not covered in the warranty. For example, if you take your car off-roading, there goes your warranty. If you go racing in your car, for obvious reasons, there goes your warranty. And there are some other things that aren't covered, like for example, creaks and rattles. They are not covered under warranty unless it's related to a major fault those squeaks and rattles aren't going to be fixed. Your only alternative is to turn up the stereo. And that's another thing that's pretty good about this car is the stereo is decent. So the stereo is good, the warranty is amazing, the car runs like a dream, it's comfortable, it's feature filled. I'm really not seeing too many downsides. I could see a lot of Kiwis running out and buying one of these. And if you were to buy one, and here comes an important plug for Ecotricity, because they make these videos possible, you're going to need some way to charge it. Now, Ecotricity provides New Zealand's only carbon zero certified electricity. That means every single electron they produce is completely clean. Wind, hydro, solar, that's it. And if you were to get an electric car, what I would recommend doing is checking out their Ecosaver plan. The Ecotricity Ecosaver plan offers New Zealand's cheapest off-peak carbon zero certified electricity, 
And the off-peak times, they vary during the week, but they're all weekend, every weekend, which means you can drive your car for next to nothing on Carbon Zero certified electricity all weekend, every weekend. So why not join the good fight? Sign up at ecotricity.co.nz, you save money, you eliminate your carbon footprint, and you get yourself some green cred. There is no downside. All right, hi there, my Kirotoro. We've made it in two hours and 34 minutes. We've done 214 kilometers so far. Now, I was hoping that by the time we got here to Rotorua, the battery would have about 30% left in it, but no, we've used a lot more than I thought we would. The battery's at 22%, and we've still got 5Ks to go. I think the reason we've used so much power is, one, I've been driving fairly enthusiastically. I've used the passing lanes to overtake some cars occasionally, and also that long stretch of the Waikato Expressway doing 100Ks an hour, 110, sorry, that really eats the range. So I think you could do 320Ks per charge, but you'd have to drive really economically. And my efficiency so far is 15.9 kilowatt hours per 100K, which is still better than the official stats, so that's confusing. But how fast does it charge? That's what we've got to find out. So we are not far away from the hyper rapid charger. It's not a regular charger. This is a hyper rapid charger, which can charge at stupidly fast speeds. And you should know that it uses Ecotricity's clean renewable electricity as do all of ChargeNet's hyper rapid chargers and their rapid chargers it's all super super clean power so guilt free charging just got to find where it is first that's got to be them ChargeNet oh yeah oh sweet oh good there's two of them as well okay sweet so these are hyper rapid chargers and there's two of them and each one can deliver 300 kilowatts of power stupidly high amount of power okay let's stop Plug in and see how fast this thing charges. All right, using one of these things is pretty straightforward. You can use a mobile app or your ChargeNet key fob. You wave it in front of a little sensor and then you've got a choice of plug types to use. So you've got a choice between CCS or CHAdeMO. Now those are plug types. This car uses CCS, which is this style shape, which fits in to this plug here. Together, that's CCS. You've got DC and AC, which makes CCS, and you've got two CCS connectors. You take the one that's flashing, there we go, and simply plug it in. And that's it. Okay, the car's gonna talk to the charger, and it'll do the rest. So now we get to see how fast it'll charge and how long it will take to get to 80%. So it reckons to 100%, 64 minutes, which gives me the impression it's probably gonna take about 40 minutes to get to 80%. Now that's not ridiculously fast, and the charging speed is also not ridiculously fast. It's what, 61 kilowatts it's ramped up to so far, and it's taken a long time to get there. So in the meantime, I'm gonna head inside and get something to eat, and we'll leave this car to do its charging. Oh, that's good timing. I just heard the charger click. Okay, so the car, oh, and it's just unlocked. <laughs> that's perfect timing. And that's done, so that is about 58 minutes from 20% to 100%, or just 30 minutes to get up to 80%, and that's what people normally do. They'll charge their car from 20 or so to 80% full because that's the most efficient way of charging, and then boom, you hit the road again, and that is what I'm doing right now. And we are off, and I just got a text message from ChargeNet telling me how much that charging session cost. From 20% to 100% full, it costs just under 27 bucks. Now that's not too bad for about 250 k's worth of motoring for 27 bucks, and you are paying for convenience. You're paying for the convenience of being able to drive across the entire country on electric power, clean electric power at that. But if you were to charge at home using Ecotricity's EcoSaver plan, for example, a full charge in this car would cost about 10 bucks. $10. Like, when was the last time you could do 250 kilometers in a car for 10 bucks. Not since the 80s or the 70s. Either way, this is making motoring fun again. It's making motoring affordable again. <laughs> this is the way to go. Electric's not the future, it's the present. Especially at these prices. Madness. Anyway, onwards to Auckland. The car made light work of the journey, but roadworks and traffic meant I'd got back to Auckland just in time for rush hour. Well, I'm back in Auckland. The return journey took a lot longer than I thought because of roadworks and road closures, which means I've now arrived back to Auckland at 5.30 p.m. on a Friday evening. So, yeah, I'm stuck in traffic. But this does give me an excuse to use a really Tesla-like gadget that's built into this car. So, watch this. If I turn on the cruise control, set it, 
Now if I double tap the stalk towards me, it turns on traffic mode. And what that means is that the car is now driving and steering itself. And it actually does a fairly good job. As you saw the lane keeping assist, it's just an assistant, it's not really self-driving. But when it comes to this traffic mode, relatively smooth, it keeps it close to the vehicle in front, it accelerates and brakes and it steers for you. You do have to keep your hands on the wheel though, or keep moving the wheel every now and then. But basically the car is driving itself. And something else I noticed that's really cool, if I go into the air conditioning mode, it's got a particulate matter filter. That is seriously impressive, considering the price, that is a Tesla level gadget. Same with this traffic self-steering system. That is brilliant. The amount of bang for buck you get in this car, for the price, I'm blown away. But I still don't know how well it accelerates or how well it handles and the noise level at 100 k's an hour. All this I have to find out. For that, I need to, once again, get out of Auckland. It is the last day of me having this MG ZS EV, but there are still some things I need to record. So I'm about to head out of Auckland yet again into the countryside to my secret driving road, which obviously I can't tell you where it is, to see how well this family crossover actually handles. I'm kind of curious. Let's find out. We have escaped Auckland City, so now it's time for the 0 to 100 time. The road is completely empty. It's just me. Let's get on down to a stop, and I'm going to put it into sport mode. And that's all there is. There's no launch control. All right, 0 to 100. Are we ready? 3, 2, 1. Good start. What stays strong, that power. And boom, there we go. Not bad, not bad. I mean, it is a family car, but still. Now it's time to check the noise level at 100 k's an hour on this infamous coarse chip road. Now, I find that around 77 decibels is normal for this sort of size car in this price range. Let's have a look. So about 76 and a half decibels, which for this price point is pretty good. So we know the zero to 100 time is pretty good for its price. We know the noise level is pretty good for its price, but how does this handle on my secret driving road, which is somewhere around here, I'm not gonna tell you. Well, for that, I need to crank up some royalty-free music we bought the rights to. That does stupidly well for its size and what it is. It's not a rocket ship, it's not a Porsche Taycan, let's not delude ourselves. But for a family car, because of its center of gravity, it does really well. It's a suspiciously fun car to drive. Look at this! Look at this doing 100 k's an hour around that corner. It's just letting it, it's just hanging on. Oh, I can hear, finally feel the tires letting go there. All right, look at that. Even on that corner where the camber was sliding away from the corner, it still clung on nicely. Oh yeah. Easy. Oh, I do love this road as well. Finally getting the tires to let go a little bit around that corner. Oh, this is madness. This handles too well for a family car. That's crazy. You can feel that 1.6 tons of weight, the majority of that being the battery, right down close to the road. I mean, look at it go around that corner. <laughs> I need to reiterate that it's not a sports car, but it's really forgiving for what it is. It will allow you to have a lot of fun. See, you can't do this in a regular petrol-powered crossover. The center of gravity would be way out, and the weight distribution would be miles off. But even in a family car that happens to have a big battery pack underneath it, like this one, it's still hand... Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm getting the tires to chip, finally! I must apologize to MG when I hand their car back, it's going to have slightly worn tires. <laughs> Oh, there's only so much more I can squeeze into this video, so let's wrap it up. That's the gist of the MG ZS EV. It's a great car, but there are some downsides. For example, it only has a 500 kilo towing rating, only good enough for a garden trailer or for perhaps a bike rack. 
Number two, it has no spare tire. So if you're gonna go long distance, you're gonna to wanna to get a space saver, invest in one of those. And number three, as far as interior options go, this is it. And it's stylish, I'll give it that, but it's black and gray, and this is the only option you've got. And I'm so tired of black and gray interiors, and when I come to power, burgundy options will be mandatory. You have been warned, know that before you vote for me. However, the list of pros outweighs the list of cons tenfold. I mean, it's got range, it's got acceleration, it handles well, it's full of gadgets, it's comfortable, that five-star safety rating, and that stupidly long warranty. I'd go personally, I'd go for the lower spec Excite version over the Essence version, because I can forego electric seats and electric wing mirrors and wireless charging. I can live without that if it means I'm getting an electric car that does up to 320 Ks per charge with a five-star safety rating and a seven-year warranty for $41,000. I mean, seriously, if you're in the market for an electric car and the ZS EV meets your range and price requirements, honestly, you'd be crazy not to at least give it a test drive because in terms of bang for buck, this is number one.